And for our final uh, pre-lunch panel this morning, please make welcome Dr. Steve Sokol, the CEO of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. Make welcome Dr. Sokol this morning. I'm Steve Sokol. I'm the president of the World Affairs Council and delighted to be with you today. Thank you, Simon, for the invitation to, to moderate this panel. Um, you'll see that we have quite a feat. We have uh, five panelists and uh, about 40 minutes. So, uh, and this is keeping you from lunch. So I hope that we can keep this, this light and interesting. Um, but I think you'll find that this panel will pull together a number of the things that we've heard during the course of today. I'd like to invite the panelists to come up onto the stage and take your seats. Um, we do have a very distinguished panel, as I mentioned. Esther Barazzoni, the president of Chatham University, is coming out first. And um, Paulina Jaramillo, who's the executive director of Renew Elect uh, Project and um, an associate professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Todd Johnson just sat down. He's the global head of renewable energy and sustainability at Jones Day. Right behind me is Shaquille Rahman. He's senior director for strategic initiatives at NRG Solar. And right behind me now is Randy Gom the Vice President for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa in the nuclear power plant business and project development at Westinghouse. So this panel is going to um, continue to really kind of build the bridge between this region and the Middle East. And we'll, we will be looking at renewable and alternative energy sources and the impact that they've had for us here in this region, but also the potential impact in the Middle East and around the world. And I'd like to begin by maybe just reminding everybody in the room a little bit about some of the emerging trends in the region that we're thinking about. The six Gulf Council countries, the Saudi, Ara Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, Oman, and the United Arab Emirates, as well as Bahrain, now consume more primary energy than the whole of Africa, and yet they have 1 20th of the population of Africa. And almost 100% of that energy currently um, is produced from oil and gas without carbon dioxide ab abatement. According to some estimates, if the region's fuel demand continues to rise as it has over the last decade, it will double by 2024, which in the scheme of things is not really that far away. And there's little doubt that the energy intensity of this region um, is high and is rising in a way that's very different from other industrialized countries, and that part of this is driven by some systemic inefficiencies, which we might learn about during this panel. At the same time, some of the trends that we often read about include population growth, rapid urbanization, economic growth, and these factors are putting a tremendous amount of pressure on existing infrastructure and also on the energy needs. Over the next uh, 30 years or so, the total investments needed in energy in the Middle East and Northern Africa are estimated at over $30 billion a year. These trends post pose challenges. There's no doubt about that. But I think that they also pose some really incredible opportunities and that this region can take advantage of some of those opportunities. And I'd like to, to really start by talking about some of the great things that are going on here in the region which might be replicable elsewhere. And to begin with that, I'd like to start by turning to Dr. Esther Barazzoni uh, from Chatham University because um, under Esther Barazzoni's leadership at Chatham, the university has made an, a considerable commitment to sustainability, um, but also to environmental education and to practices. And one of the ways in which this has manifested itself is the development of a sustainable campus, the Eden Hall campus. And um, Esther was actually, very recently this past summer, recognized um, or the university was recognized, and she accepted um, a award for the Sustainable Campus Excellence Award uh, from the International Sustainable Campus Network. 
And Chatham was the only North American university to be honored with this recognition at that ceremony. So hats off to you, Esther, and the work yes. that you do. And we'd love to hear a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing. Well, thank you very much for that. And hello, it's nice to be here with you. Um, we were given 400 acres in 2008. And our current campus is a 144-year-old campus, the alma mater of Rachel Carson, 18 miles away. We were given this opportunity to develop something that we felt needed to be something of significance. So we embarked on the development of something that, listening to the panels earlier today, I would say is the nexus of energy, water, food security, and education. So brings all those things together. We decided to engage in green development uh, in the creation, not just of a campus, but basically of a new community because this 400 acres can be uh, a model for how communities can be developed in the future in um, greenfield uh, development. So we studied the land to see what its carrying capacity would be using all natural processes to process the wastewater and also to um, power the energy, power the campus with solar energy, as well as transitional uh, uses of natural gas. We do believe that uh, natural gas is terribly important, and we all need to use it and learn to use it in carbon neutral ways. But the, it, too, is a fossil fuel, and it will decline. And so it is important to think about transitional steps. We created a school of sustainability, teaching graduate and undergraduate programs. And also, uh, we created a food studies program, which would look particularly at food security for urban areas. But what goes for urban areas obviously goes uh, for uh, areas that are, that are not urban as well. So this is the scope of the project. And thank you for mentioning the award. We did receive uh, an award for the integration of architecture and education, because this is a living laboratory, not only for a university campus, uh, but also for, as I say, green community economic development. One of the goals, which I think is mentioned on screen, is to lower our energy usage from the average for this reason, region of 168 kBTUs per square foot a year to 20. Uh, this is breathtaking, and we are learning a lot from our students about the sort of behavior modification that needs to take place uh, after you're done trying to engineer everything out uh, of the system. Um, the, the project is processing all the wastewater through plants. Uh, it is using a stormwater uh, runoff management system. Uh, which is using tanks as well as the natural flows of the ground. We're engaging in sustainable agriculture, participating with the farmers in our local community. We're not trying to be entirely self-sufficient because that's part of sustainability um, as well. So I think um, I will just list a few of the things that we're using. Solar PV systems for energy, canopy solar panels, geothermal wells, which you had up there just a moment ago, was the uh, energy loops that are moving the heat around from one building to the other, and uh, solar hot water panels. Uh, so this campus has just begun. We've done the ribbon cutting on the first piece of it uh, just a few weeks, just a, a week ago, I guess, two weeks ago. Uh, and we're off and running and eager to talk and learn uh, from the rest of you and partner with you for a project that has been um, understood to be the first in the world of its kind. So we are very excited to be engaged in this activity. I'd like to ask a follow-up question to that. And one of the things that you commented on was reducing the energy use to begin right. with. But one of the other big issues with renewable energy is the high cost. Right. What has happened to make some of the renewable energy use that you've right. engaged in a little bit more affordable and accessible? Right. Thank you for that question. And that's one thing that's that's very, very important, obviously. Uh, 
you have to be able to afford in order to be able to replicate what you're doing. And we keep trying to push costs out of this project. And so we frequently go, go, back, to, uh, <laughs> go back to the, to the ground. And, we found that it was much too expensive on particularly the building where a lot of the cooking uh, would be done to be doing completely solar panels. Uh, we, we simply couldn't afford to do it. So we, we've done two things there. One is we have partnered with a for-profit organization and worked out an arrangement whereby um, one of these complicated arrangements basically that packs, pass on since we are a not-for-profit. The uh, the energy tax credits uh, to another organization. And we will be uh, the owners of those panels after six years, but not initially. We'll be paying uh, less than half the cost of that. So, so that was the kind of thing that partnerships can bring about. And secondly, the, the use of the natural gas fuel cells to supplement the use of solar was very important we know that we can't afford to be Epcot. We can't afford to be totally futuristic. That future in which natural gas is gone is not here yet. So the point is to use it intelligently and responsibly now. So these fuel cells do not burn the gas uh, to produce energy. And over time, we will trans uh, transfer them to using biogas. As, as we have more uh, residents on the campus. Uh, so all kinds of transitions being thought through. I might say that phase one of this campus, which uh, has created all of the infrastructure, we say we've built from under the ground up, uh, that our research labs there are periscopes into what's going on below the ground, cost $17.5 million for essentially three buildings, rehabs of two, and the underground infrastructure for everything that's needed for a startup campus for 150. Whereas our athletic facility that we built a few years back cost $18 million. So we are very, very cost conscious and are being successful, though any individual piece of it is, of course, costly. But we're building a, a, a bit more costly, maybe 20% more. But we're building nothing below lead platinum standards. So I'd now like to turn to Paulina. You, you of course, have an a interdisciplinary approach to energy consumption. You're an engineer, but you also focus on public policy. You look at social, economic, and environmental aspects of energy consumption. And some of the tools that can support sustainable energy development and energy use, a little bit like what Esther was talking about um, in the, the case study of the Eden Hall campus. Let's start by talking a little bit about the Renewalec project that you've been working on. The idea behind that, the way that I understand it, is to use renewable power um, for the generation of electricity. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So the Renewalec project is Try again. Is that better? Yeah. Thank you. So the Renewal Act project um, is a project housed in the Kepler School of Business at Carnegie Mellon and the Department of Engineering and Public Policy. We started in 2010, <clears throat> and we've had a core group of about, do I have two microphones now? <laughs> <laughs> you might. Um, we have about a, ten, a core group of 10 PhD students working on this project. We're now wrapping up and writing a book the goal of the project was to evaluate the challenges and opportunities for larger scale integration of renewable resources into the US power system. Um, we have focused mostly on wind resources. We've done some work on solar as well. And we've looked at the technical and economic challenges and solutions to these challenges. Um, so that has been the focus. Can, can you focus a little bit more on some of those challenges? Because I think you know, that helps frame perhaps where some opportunities lie, but also where um, you know, these are domestic issues, local issues in many senses, but they also have global implications. Yeah. <clears throat> so the, I think, okay, 
Now I have three microphones. So if, if we thought stereo was good, this is even better. So the economic challenges for wind, I think we're getting closer and closer to overcoming the economic challenges. Wind, um, onshore wind is about a $2,000 per kilowatt, which is now getting close to competitive. The, I think the largest uncertainty, the largest challenge in terms of the economics has been the uncertainty on the production tax credits that wind has faced. Uh, last year, there was a boom of construction of wind resources because the tax credit was going to expire in 2012 at the end, and no one knew if it was going to be extended. They did extend it, but I, I think that this year we will see much uh, less added capacity because there were no projects already in the pipeline for this year. Um, so there's, there's still some economic challenges, but we've been focusing a lot on the technical challenges. Wind is a variable and intermittent uh, renewable resource. Um, so that, and our power system was built and has been operated with controllable uh, resources that can generate power on demand. We can make them produce more power or less power as we want. We can't do that with wind and solar. So I think that that has been, it's a, um, it's a challenge that we can overcome, but there are costs associated with uh, overcoming the challenges. And I think it's important to realize that there are limits to what we can do with solar and wind on their own, um, which I think it's important <coughs> to keep in mind when, we'll be, when we're building new systems in other parts of the world that do not have such a legacy infrastructure. Thank you. So let's widen the aperture, aperture a little bit and, and go to Todd Johnson, the global head of uh, renewable energy and sustainability at, at Jones Day. One of the areas where Todd works is in renewable energy, sustainable growth, and um, with energy efficiency companies. And so this, what you've heard so far, is nothing new to you on, on many, many levels. Um, but I'd like you to maybe help us build a bridge to the Middle East because you've done a lot of work um, focusing on solar development initiatives in the Middle East. And there's, there's sort of an inherent question in that. Why would an energy rich region be looking at renewable energy sources? Yeah, it, it goes for the United States too. I mean, we're an incredibly energy rich country. Um, so why do it? And I think the natural assumption that most people make is, oh, well, Todd's a tree hugger, and he's going to give us the tree hugging explanation. Um, but that's not the answer. The answer is really pure economics. Um, long term, uh, from an economic perspective, it only makes sense. And anyone who's ever penciled it out understands it makes sense. Uh, my wife and I put uh, PV on our rooftop uh, a year or so ago, and uh, I've got to tell you that it's not going to pay off to us for six or seven years, but when it pays off, it's like an annuity in terms of the savings on our electricity bill. And no one in California believes that electricity costs are going down long term. And the same is true globally. Um, energy production costs are not going down. Um, and so harnessing the, the natural resources that we have that are free, like wind and solar, simply make economic sense. Unfortunately, in the United States, we've turned it into an eco-political football, and so we have the kinds of uncertainty we do around tax credits and policy that would help to sustain it. People think that you know, it's a huge subsidy to things like solar and wind. Actually, it's, it's, it's really simply a certainty that business is looking for. Um, any business, and you all, all of you who are business people know this, uh, the worst thing from a business perspective is uncertainty, and when public policy gets in the way and creates uncertainty, it's bad for business, always. Sometimes it creates some opportunities, but mostly it's bad for business. And that's what we've been suffering in the United States. The nice thing is that in the Middle East, um, there is certainty. And uh, there have been some initiatives uh, in <coughs> the region, in particular United, United Arab Emirates, uh, also very well known, the KA Care Project in Saudi Arabia, um, and as well as uh, Kuwait has a smaller version of that. And I think um, for those of, those of you uninitiated in the solar world, 
um, I would offer a couple of compares, comparisons and contrasts. Um, the, the country with the greatest penetration of solar installation is Germany. Um, if you were to take a look at the solar footprint, the, the solar radiation footprint of Germany and Europe, uh, and compare it to something like the United States, you'd actually have to go all the way to Alaska to find anything as bad as the solar radiation footprint in Germany. Um, you take a look at the United States and compare that to the Middle East, uh, Northern Africa and the Middle East, and you can see very quickly why solar is an amazing opportunity there. And I think Shaquille will talk a little bit about the economics behind it because it's not just an opportunity um, from a carbon emission standpoint. Clearly a concern, the Middle East has on a per capita basis the highest uh, carbon emissions uh, on a per capita basis of almost anywhere in the world. So that's clearly a concern, but actually if you just get down to the dollars and cents and penciling it out and looking at the balance of trade that the Middle East has on exporting uh, petroleum products, you quickly see that the growth in the region is gonna cannibalize the, uh, the cash reserves and, and balance of trade that they have enjoyed for so long, um, just purely out of growth. And that's before you ever get into the subsidies. And I think Shaquille can talk about that pretty well. So I know that Shaquille will, will follow up on what you have to, to say, but, but let me ask you a quick follow up, which is how much of this is, is rhetoric and how much of it is reality? Um, I, you know, great question. And I, I confront this all the time. I speak, I speak in two different kinds of conferences usually. Conferences of business people focused on what are long-term solutions to energy needs and conferences of uh, sustainability people who are the fruits and nuts and tree-hugging folks. Um, and so I have to have an answer to that question for both. And I guess what I would say is, I think the proof is in what you see. Um, you look at the installation in the United States over the last 10 years, and it's pretty obvious that there's an opportunity in solar and wind uh, in the United States. Our biggest uh, constraining force at the moment is our grid. Uh, that's, that's a whole nother topic. Um, you look at the Middle East, and I think you quickly understand that there's a powerful economic rationale for why the Middle East needs to be implementing uh, solar and wind solutions to their energy production needs. And <clears throat> I emphasize the, the penciling out part because I think the economic viability is, is the part that really plays, especially to a business crowd. Um, I think what happens because we've created this polariz polarizing uh, dichotomy in terms of how we dialogue about this between the fruits and nuts tree hugger folks and the business people, I think the problem is we, we start to talk about, about it like it's an either or solution. Like we're trying to create a solar and wind infrastructure that's going to replace nuclear, replace other forms of coal generation facilities. That's just not the case. That's never gonna happen anywhere. Uh, what we need is a good energy mix and we need a better energy mix. Yes, it's good that it reduces carbon emissions. That's important from a climate change perspective. But I think more importantly, it's important from an economic perspective long-term. Thanks. So Shaquille, let's, this is a great transition to you because um, certainly in some of the work that you've been doing, you've been working closely with the KA Care project that Todd mentioned. And um, that's a very ambitious project um, to really try to promote a greater energy mix and draw on renewables uh, to a far greater degree uh, in, in Saudi Arabia. And it has a real potential to be a game changer in the region. So let me start by asking you to talk a little bit about that project and about the implications that it could have. Sure. Um, is it working? All right, great. Um, the KCARE program uh, is probably the biggest initiative in renewable energy in the world. And it's clearly the biggest in the region. Um, their goals are heady, 40, mega, uh, 40 gigawatts uh, of renewable in uh, close to, by 2030. Now, things will get delayed, but the overall program is about 54 gigawatts, which is a combination of solar, wind, waste, all of it. So why? Why take on the biggest program in the world? It's a price tag of about $100 billion. Exactly. So there are two reasons that they've done it. 
And there's a third reason why NRG and companies all over the solar value chain and the renewable value chain are looking at the market. The main reason is that currently almost all of the electricity generation uh, is driven by oil um, at probably a subsidized cost, we think, in the market of about $4 a barrel. Uh, the market value of that oil is $100 a barrel. Um, $100 a barrel, we have equated electricity cost to be about 24 cents a kilowatt hour. Solar has come to a point where very conservative numbers, not aggressive, but realistic market value, different parts of the world on an unsubsidized basis, you can probably produce solar, solar energy at about 10 to 11 cents a kilowatt hour. There's your difference. Four cents of subsidized electricity, 11 cents of where solar could be, 24 cents of what their real cost of electricity is because they're basically burning oil. So that's the economic driver. It's the same economic driver that has focused people in the solar market to look at other regions, for example, the Caribbean. There's a huge push in the Caribbean for solar energy Again, with the premise that in some nations you're paying 40 to 50 cents a kilowatt hour, like the Bahamas or the Cayman Islands or Aruba, where it's purely oil generation. So that's the driver. Now, Saudi is, bless their heart, trying to tackle a problem that's on a much, much larger scale. And it is absolutely in their interest to do so. They expect their electricity demand to grow double in the net by 2020. So they have some huge problems ahead that they're trying to solve. Their, their electricity demand also ties very well into their water desalination costs. Sixty percent of their water production is through desalination and it's only going to grow. So that's what their driver is. Now, the electric demand is consumer-based, agricultural-based. There needs to be a lot of education that also goes with the renewable industry growing. But why is the Saudi market an opportunity that we may never see again? Very few countries or nations or regions can pay for it. If you look at the region, we're talking about $150 billion. Saudi alone, $100 billion. So first, they have the resources to actually transform their electric generation industry into a renewable mix. But it's just not the fact that they can pay for it. Their sophistication in the region, as you well know, of a capital market that can support it. You could never put in $150 billion of infrastructure development in any area without a capital markets to support it. And they have a very significant capital appetite. They have uh, funds, capital requirements. Uh, between Dubai and other nations, they literally have funds that have been designed to attract infrastructure capital into the region. They now have a, uh, you know, Sharia Islamic financing is now sophisticated and has been around enough to attract hundreds of billions of dollars of capital. So you have a situation where you have the resources, the solar resources, the renewable resources. You have the capital markets to support it, the financing markets to support it. And actually, uh, what's also impressive is that there is now a very well-established knowledge of project financing and infrastructure financing in the region. And uh, No, I was just going to piggyback on that because the one piece of the puzzle that you didn't talk about was um, <clears throat> they estimate that it's going to create 2 million jobs over time for Saudi Arabia. And uh, more importantly, perhaps, an expertise in the solar value chain that will be homegrown for manufacturing and development of new technologies over time. And let me just add one more thing. It's very important. I think uh, the gentleman from Egypt talked about the demographics of, of the region. And there are a lot of people in the age group of 20 to 30. And employment is a significant issue in this region. It's also a political issue. You must, you know, 
we all know from, from all of our experiences that you need to work. And, and K-Care has been designed carefully to make sure that there's job growth because the goal here also is to provide advantageous solar projects with local manufacturing. So it's a very well thought out program. Uh, it's been delayed, as you know, by uh, they were supposed to launch the RFP proposal, but it's been delayed. And it will be delayed as they struggle with the issue, which is my parting point, is who's going to pay for this differential of electricity being produced at four cents a kilowatt hour or based on four dollars a barrel versus 11 cents on uh, what we think the solar pricing will be. And there's different electricity pricing for different renewables because CSP will also be a big player. Wind will be a big player. Somebody has to figure out how to pay for the program. And the trick there is that how do you monetize um, something that you're not taking out of the ground? Because what they really will be doing is saying, hey, I'm going to take my four barrel, uh, my oil, which is I'm going to sell in the market for $100 a barrel in the future or more instead of burning it for $4 a barrel now. And that is really the question that I think the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is resolving right now. They're trying to figure out which, which department or administration in the government is going to pay for it. Most likely, Ministry of Finance will be the ultimate arbiter using Saudi Electric Corporation and Aramco as a means of, of facilitating the matter. I have a quick question. Yeah. Where's the $11 per kilowatt hour coming from? That's, that's the view. Right now, our solar pricing, when we are looking at what we think cost of electricity is for solar, you know, we're seeing um, the market has shifted PPA rates are about, in the US they're down to about eight to nine, but, but that's really a subsidy-based cost. So yeah, so what's the capital cost and capacity factor assumption that- Well, capacity factor is very, and this, the insulation we think is anywhere from 1800 to 1900, but we think it's, the, the goal that they're looking at is about two bucks a watt all in. So I was, Shaquille, I was going to ask one more follow-up and then we'll move on to, to Randy, and that is, as you take a step back, what's the overall implication or, or impact on the region? I mean, we're talking about Saudi Arabia. W what sort of a lasting effect do you think there could be in other countries? Well, and Saudi Arabia is not the only nation, right? So right. we have um, Kuwait, Arab Emirates. Uh, Morocco has a huge solar program, as you well know. This is the region that is looking to really expand the solar resource. They're trying to create a manufacturing base to support the region and, and perhaps the world. They want to take advantage of their low cost electricity pricing to do so. Um, give you an example. Um, certain you know, thin film manufacturing is extremely electricity intensive. So uh, Saudi may be a great place to build uh, thin film panels, for example. So they're looking at this value chain very carefully uh, and trying to figure out what is the best way to create a development, manufacturing, production, and export business in the region. And the other part of that that is critical to the region is, of course, job creation and political stability that will arise out of the job creation. So let's turn to Randy and to, to nuclear technology. And um, of course, your company, Westinghouse, is active in Saudi Arabia as well. Why don't you talk a little bit about what differentiates Westinghouse from, from other companies that are active in the region in, in this field? Well, uh, first of all, Westinghouse, uh, many of you probably don't realize, is responsible for about 50% of the nuclear technology for the operating units in the world. There are 430 operating units. and and uh, almost half of those are based on Westinghouse technology. So, so we've been in this business a long time and it's proven. Uh, so, so we think that, that that's one key differentiator. Another one is the fact that our commitment to safety 
uh, following Three Mile Island back in the late 70s, Westinghouse developed the AP1000, which is a, a passive plant which relies and takes the operator out of the equation, if you will, in the event, in the unlikely and very rare event of, a, of an accident. So it relies on natural forces like gravity, evaporation, condensation to cool the core. And uh, so it's, it's uh, increased investment in technology, not just in, uh, in new plants, but also in uh, the operating fleet. Because quite frankly, the operating fleet, if it doesn't operate safely and efficiently, there will be no uh, new build program. And I think the last thing is the fact that we, we have the opportunity to stimulate the economy in, uh, in the area, both in Western Pennsylvania and in the US, but also in the area where we built. We have a, we have a slogan called, we buy where we build. Uh, we, we have the ability with our design to localize much of the equipment, much of the components, all of the labor for construction comes from the area where we're building. So it's a huge uh, stimulus to the economy in, in that particular region. And as the technology is developed in western Pennsylvania, it's a, it's a huge stimulus here as well. Um, as many of you probably know, we're already building uh, units in the United States and in China. We've got four units under construction in China. Uh, of the AP1000. They'll be coming online and producing electricity at the end, the first unit at the end of 2014. So in uh, almost a year's time, a little over a year, we'll be generating electricity. And the units in the United States, down in Georgia and South Carolina, those, uh, those were, uh, first concrete was uh, poured in March of 2012, so they're well under construction now. Equipment is showing up, it's being installed, and those plants will be in line in the 2017 timeframe. Um, so it's a, it's a, I think some of those things are our commitment to safety, our commitment to stimulating the economy in those areas, and, and I agree with my colleague, the, 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 the energy mix is so important in areas uh, in, in all parts of the world, but, but particularly in the Middle East, it's, there's no silver bullet, there's no one source, you have to have a mix of renewables, uh, fossil, and, uh, and nuclear. So. So I have a, a bunch of follow-up questions for the panel, but in the interest of time, are there questions from the audience? There's one in the way back and one in the middle. Hi, I'm David Luke from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, somebody mentioned the one of the barriers to deploying renewable energies in the US is the state of our grid system. So I was wondering if you could, if someone could comment on how the, the grid in Saudi Arabia um, is maybe moving towards being able to integrate more renewables, um, or maybe possibly in China as well. Uh, sure. Um, the grid, you know, the grid changes in the world are are going on as we speak, and so Saudi, their plan is to introduce different mixes into the grid, including baseload power, intermittency with solar. CSP, which adds a, a baseload component to it with peak shaving and nuclear to obviously help them. The whole goal in the grid system in the United States, uh, Europe, and especially, uh, if you'll notice in the Caribbean, is in order to introduce intermittent power, you have to have some stabilization mechanisms, either through grid control, distributed generation, or storage. And uh, technology-wise, I think the, the big, um, the big game changer will be storage as we see it taking place right now. I am working on uh, a couple of projects in Puerto Rico where Puerto Rico has kind of set the standard in the market for, for ramp rate, ramp, uh, ramp up and ramp rate, which is basically how electricity behaves as cloud cover comes with intermittency. And they've required a very stringent standard which has forced controller companies and storage mechanisms to really meet, step up to the plate. And so what we're seeing is systems with 25% storage for solar. In Puerto Rico, we're seeing very similar centralized storage programs in Europe. California has just put out an RFP. Um, so I think that you're gonna see this. In Saudi, it's being tackled more on a macro level because of the energy mix that they're going to introduce. But they'll be ahead of the game, too, where they will introduce more uh, distributed storage as well. So then there was a question just up here. So the mic is coming.
Thank you. Um, Siggy Neubauer, American Middle East Institute. Quick question um, about um, the nuclear programs in the Middle East. I wanted to ask a little bit about the uh, one, two, two, one, two, three agreement uh, that we have with uh, the UAE and uh, their program in particular. Um, some have said that that is a gold standard for um, a transparent nuclear program. And uh, are there similar agreements underway with some of the other GCC countries? And um, where, where is, how, it, how would you describe this program developing? And um, are there also more um, efforts that we can do to um, strengthen those kind of corporations? Thank you. Um. Well, the one, two, three, I, I don't think the government likes the term gold standard anymore. We've been, we've been coached by our contacts there that they, they prefer, uh, they, they don't prefer that term. But uh, as uh, what the gentleman's referring to is the United Arab Emirates a few years ago uh, put a bilateral in place, a one, two, three agreement with the United States, which allows us to export uh, uh, nuclear components and, and, and whatnot. Uh, and we're working with a Korean partner in the, uh, in the Emirates to build four plants at the Baraka site. So that's been quite effective. Uh, they've, uh, they've been very successful there. It's a, it's a licensee of Westinghouse that's building the plant. And so, so we're, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of scope there. One of the benefits was we were able to help facilitate a $2 billion XM bank loan to, to the project. So uh, because of U.S. content that, that we were able to export uh, to that particular project. Uh, there's some other countries we're working with in the uh, in the Middle East, uh, uh, where you're working with KAKR in Saudi Arabia. They're 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 responsible not only for the renewable but also the nuclear program, the atomic program, and so they have a very aggressive program in place. Uh, the U.S. government and the Saudi government is in fact in negotiations right now for a, a one two three agreement. We are also uh, planning on uh, submitting A10 agreements, which are, allows us to export technology. That's one of the key things and the key drivers in Saudi Arabia is Saudiization, where they want to develop the younger workforce into more white collar, high tech type jobs. And so we want to work to try to transfer technology so that they can, they can carry this on uh, in the region. There are other countries uh, in the Middle East, in the GCC, that have, uh, have infrastructure programs that, that have nuclear on the agenda, but they haven't come out publicly and said that, uh, that they are going to go build nuclear at this point in time. So, so we're focused right now in, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, and, uh, and beginning to look in Turkey as well. Sure. One closing comment. Oh, I had a question. Or a question, OK. Yeah. that you've gone to conferences with the tree hoggers and have. So how, what is your, how do you justify um, solar and renewables in the Middle East? What's your environmental justification for these low carbon sources in the Middle East? Um, <clears throat> the mid I mean, Saudi Arabia and that region of the Middle East on a per capita basis emits more carbon than anywhere in the world. So what more justification do you well, need? Well, but that's from a just carbon leakage. They're going to sell that oil to China and India. Yeah, no, so but they're, well, they're also burning it for generations. Right, but if they're burning it, China is not buying it. When they're not burning it, China will buy it. So you're still emitting that CO2. That's just carbon leakage. Yeah, so from a global perspective, it's easy to say it net net, right? Net. It nets nothing. out. It nets out. And it harms all of us. But when you start looking at a country by country perspe uh, perspective, the Middle East as a region understands that um, the air is also a natural resource. And so you're talking about air pollutants, not carbon. No, I'm talking about both. I'm talking about carbon is a gas. global problem, right? So I, the emissions, if the oil from Saudi Arabia is born, it's just combusted in China. Sure. So it's Paulina, I, maybe I'm not tracking with your question. What's your What's your point? I guess my point is that when you, we make arguments about environmental benefit of solar and renewables. We have to be very careful about what is our uh, boundary. I mean, if we're displacing oil in Saudi Arabia so they, dis so they can sell it in the global market, we're not displacing carbon. So there's the climate justification isn't there. The other so thing I, di I disagree is because I think that, <coughs> you know, Shaquille and I were just talking about this, you know, in Saudi Arabia, to buy electricity is what, four, four cents on a subsidized basis? Right. 
Um, and he was just telling me a story that they figured out that if you actually ran generators, you could do it for cheaper than buying electricity off the grid in Saudi Arabia. Um, <clears throat> when, barrel, uh, when a barrel of oil could sell anywhere in the world for $100 a barrel, and you're burning it at $4 a barrel, there's a clear differential there economically that's just going to drive lower consumption than what's being used over time. So I think you're wrong. Well, I think that Saudi Arabia will use less. Saudi Arabia will use less, and maybe the price will stay depressed or stay down, and other people will simply buy up all the production they do. But I think that's not where the world is heading. So the other thing is, when we look at the US, the financial benefits of solar do not necessarily align with the places where you get the most environmental benefits. So our best solar resources are, and there was a map going on uh, with the solar resources, the best solar resources are in the West and in California, where yep. we already have a very clean grid, right? So that's where you can make the most money, but that's not necessarily where you're gonna get the most environmental benefits. So I think that when we talk about the environmental benefits of wind and solar, you have, you have to be cognizant about global systems and global impacts and the trade-offs between the environmental benefits and the financial market so, for it. Which is, which is why I wasn't making the environmental right. case. I, I, and I don't think the environmental case, it, the funny thing about Saudi Arabia is it's much more of an economic case. Absolutely. However, you have to, you do look at it from the perspective that it's not necessarily true that they're going to burn that oil in China. It could very well be that the oil won't be produced under OPEC conditions. It won't be exported, it won't be burned. And in the initial period, it may be exported 100 years from now if oil is still our most major use for resource for driving cars. So there is an argument that you don't know what will happen. But you, do, you are taking something out of the air now. So there is some environmental benefit. So given the soundtrack that's yep. been added, <laughs> we're out of time. But I think what's obvious to everybody is that we're only scratching the surface on this conversation. And I guess I would like to to close by um, reading a statement um, from the UAE's Minister of Energy at the most recent World Energy Congress. He said, we recognize that change is part of the industry and went on to say that traditional sources of energy on their own are not enough. The UAE is actively diversifying its energy mix. And I think this notion of an energy mix is what we've started to put our arms around here with this panel. But it's also something that I think we as a region can leverage because in many ways this region exemplifies the energy mix and one of the things for all of us who are in Pittsburgh to think about is how we can take that knowledge and that leadership and work with people in the Middle East and around the world because these are global issues that we're talking about to try to deal with some of the energy challenges ahead. So thanks again to the panelists and um, this has been a lot of fun.